Before we proceed to the video, for more LEAD AP O plus M study material, you can contact me on my email and on my LinkedIn as usual. Hello and welcome to Indoor Environmental Quality for 17 points, a bit lengthy category with three prerequisites and 10 credits, which we'll be going through in the upcoming slides. It basically deals with almost everything that an occupant would be facing indoors. It could be the quality of the air that he's breathing or she is breathing. Uh, it could be the green cleaning policy, like what products to use so that they would not contaminate the air inside the building, uh, the maximum or minimum ventilation required for good uh, thermal comfort, what would be the air speed, what would be the air temperature for uh, the occupants of the building to feel comfortable, and uh, what should be the level of the lighting, and uh, what would be the quality of view from, from your desk, and if you have any pest issues. So it tries to deal with almost everything that would lead to uh, environmental quality inside the building. So let's start with the first prerequisite and uh, the similar approach. I'll try to put related credits after each prerequisite. Prerequisite number one is environmental tobacco smoke or ETS control straightforward to minimize the exposure of this ETS to building occupants and the systems installed for ventilation so that they don't pull the contaminated or ETS air inside the building. The requirements are similar to all adaptations except for schools, which is more stringent and for existing building residential, it might be a little lenient based on the codes. We're gonna see in the next slide the differences, but for all other adaptations, the indoor smoking is completely prohibited and outdoor is only allowed in the designated areas. And these designated areas should be 25 feet away from all the entries, windows and intakes which serves the purpose of minimizing the exposure of ETS to building occupants. The signage should be provided for no smoking and they are to be installed within 10 feet of all building entries. These are the requirements for <clears throat> the areas that are directly under the control of the building. However, if any designated areas used by business like uh, uh, sidewalk seating or courtyards, they are to be prohibited for smoking even if they fall outside the property line. Means that even if this area which is outside uh, the property uh, of uh, the building, if it is used for uh, business purposes, like people sit in the sidewalks, uh, seating areas, or the courtyards are being used, even then the exposure of ETS is to be minimized and these areas uh, are not allowed for any smoking. For the documentation, the provide, uh, you have to provide the description of the policy. That is a no smoking policy, including how you are communicating. Maybe you can put flyers for inside the offices. You can uh, release a memo or something. And site plan showing the designated smoking areas, which are to be 25 feet away from all the distance, uh, from all the entries, windows, and intakes, and the drawings or photos for the signage installed. This might be uh, one of the or two examples for the signage that you can install on your site and could be acceptable for uh, the documentation. For schools, the requirement is more stringent, no smoking allowed on site, not even in any designated areas, not even 25 feet away from the building. And you have to post a signage that it is uh, not allowed on site and you might be penalized under the law for for the homes we've got two options the first one is similar to all adaptations but the second one that by law or by code it it is not possible that you can uh, impose the no no smoking ban inside the homes of people so uh, what is the other strategy that you prohibit smoking in all common areas so that you do not contaminate the air and weather strip all your exterior doors and, and operable windows means that if you are smoking inside and exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, at least by weather stripping your doors and operable windows, it would not be leaking outside. You, the purpose is to minimize uncontrolled pathways for any smoke transfer. So demonstrate once every five years that the maximum leakage is this much, might be too technical, 0.5 cubic feet per minute per square feet at 50 pascals 
of the enclosure but the main idea is that uh, you are not leaking any uh, smoke or any uh, contamination outside into the uh, common areas and you can establish a baseline that how much is your current leakage and then show 30 percent uh, future improvement the documentation is the no smoking policy and how it is communicated which is usually by the signage uh, door schedule demonstrating uh, the weather stripping to stop the smoke going outside into the common areas the differential air pressure test report for future improvement and code restrictions that why you have gone for option number two because the code was not allowing you to impose no, no smoking policy inside the home so code restrictions preventing the requirements if it is available you have to submit these uh, documentation of code restrictions as well the prerequisite number two is minimum indoor air quality performance and the intent is to contribute to the comfort and well-being of the building occupants by establishing any standard for indoor air quality now before going to the requirement a little word on the ventilation which sometimes mistakenly considered for cooling or heating but it has nothing to do with it ventilation is simply changing the air use or stale air by fresh air why because there might be a moisture build up you've got co2 concentrations and uh, there might be an odor inside so the air has to be changed with the fresh air uh, in any building you've got three possibilities that you have ventilation done naturally means operable windows the air comes in and goes out from the other side of the building it heats up goes up just like in the left photo the second option is that you've got mechanically ventilated building means that the windows are not operable or at least not taken into consideration when it was being designed just like the high-rise buildings you have this glass facade and it's uh, non-operable or you cannot open the windows so all the air that is being changed inside this kind of buildings uh, is done mechanically and the third possibility is that inside your building you've got both of them working which is mixed mode means you have natural ventilation in certain spaces and you've got uh, mechanical ventilation in certain spaces so for the requirements uh, for mechanically ventilated spaces each AHU or air handling unit must comply with either case one or case two and the compliance should be shown by uh, measurements taken during, during the performance period. So what is case one is that system that is installed uh, inside your building is able to meet outdoor air flow rates that is required by the standards. Now what are these standards? We will see it in the next slide. Two options for case number one, where system is able to meet the flow rates, outdoor air flow rates required by ASHRAE 62.1. Well, we know what is ASHRAE, American Society of Heat Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, and their standard uh, is 62.1, which says that the system is able to bring 8 to 10 liters per second per person inside the building through the mechanically ventilated system installed. And if the local code is more stringent, it has to be follows. I mean, uh, the local code says that it should be 12 liter per second or 15. In that case, we'll follow not ASHRAE, but the local code. Uh, for option number two is uh, uh, the, for the projects outside US, they have to follow a different standard. And uh, in, inside the, this standard EN 15251, there are multiple things like indoor air quality, energy performance, thermal environment but for this prerequisite it should only be required for ventilation the documentation is the confirmation that project meets one of the standards either for option number one or option number two and the ventilation rates and CEN calculations and if there are any assumptions the calculation or ventilation rates would be uh, should be complying with 8 to 10 liters per second per person minimum for option number one and the measure outflow, outdoor airflow rates and what is the method of measurement, what kind of uh, equipment or measurement uh, tool is used. A ventilation maintenance program is just that in future, you will uh, keep the tool or uh, your system maintained so that the outdoor airflow rate does not fall below the requirement. 
Case number two is when the system or ventilation system is unable to meet the flow rates of outdoor air, which was in option number one, eight to 10 liter per second. But uh, in case number two, we have to perform an engineering assessment to uh, reach the maximum delivery rate possible with our system that is already installed. And it should not be less than five liters per second per person. Option number one was eight to 10, but here it is five. In case of uh, mixed mode, which is uh, both natural and mechanical ventilation system installed, minimum outdoor air opening and requirements by the same standard ASHRAE 62.1 are to be followed. And if local code is more stringent, whichever is basically more stringent is going to prevail. Some places, uh, due to the climate conditions, natural ventilation is not an effective strategy or not feasible. So if we are using any natural uh, mode ventilation, we have to show that it is effective in, in uh, the weather and climate conditions. For the documentation, maximum outdoor delivery rate and compliance that is possible and how we have reached or what is the tool that we are using to achieve this five liter per second, how is the calculation being done? In case of ventilated spaces, uh, ventilation procedure calculations and openings, which are uh, really important because openings are the only way where the air can be exchanged. And in case uh, you've got more stringent co uh, local codes, then the exception of authority having jurisdiction should be submitted as well. So credit number one, is indoor air quality management program for two points in continuation with the prerequisite number one the purpose is to maintain the well-being of occupants uh, occupants by preventing and correcting if any issue arises with in indoor air quality the requirement is to develop and implement an indoor air quality management program based on environmental protection agency iaq building education and assessment model tool called ibeam now, i'm not going to discuss in detail what is ibeam i prefer that you check the audit forms by ibeam online you just need to search in google ibeam audit forms and it's going to give you the list i think the first two res uh, results show uh, and take you to a PDF that contains these forms. It's simply about HVAC system or if there is any steam powered system and it's about changing the filters and uh, the thermal comfort and everything. So if uh, you have these systems installed, conduct an I-beam audit on regular basis. Once every five years is, is acceptable and uh, a revision if necessary or appropriate. The documentation is the OM plan, which will be adjusted after uh, having an I-beam audit with indoor air quality management program and summary of audit. And if you have find any issues, that issues are to be listed and how they are corrected. Credit number two is enhanced indoor air quality strategies for one to two points with multiple options. The uh, intent is to promote occupants comfort, well-being and productivity by improving IAQ. Uh, I have seen the, uh, some presentations and inside some articles when they promote IAQ. They also suggest that having a good indoor air quality and having a nice environment is going to uh, guarantee less absentees. And when you have less absentees from uh, your workers or occupants of the building, they will be more productive or uh, they will be generating more business. I don't know why everything has to be weighed in terms of uh, savings or money. In my personal opinion, IAQ, uh, better quality has to be provided just as a basic right of any human being or any building occupant. So it, everything not has to be weighed in terms of money. Anyhow, uh, the option number one here is entryway systems. Uh, you can see in the pictures, I'm sure you have gone through these entryway systems in multiple buildings you can see grates or grills that are provided needed to capture the dirt that might be coming from outside to inside and they have to be maintained weekly uh, must install at least 10 feet long just to capture as much dirt as possible and uh, they are to be maintained weekly for uh, warehouses and data center uh, buildings it's not required to provide for doors leading to 
uh, dock or garage because it does not serve the purpose that we are looking for but it has to be provided between the spaces and adjacent office areas for the documentation the entryway system location and measurements that is 10 feet required with photos and confirmation that system is maintained weekly maybe you can submit the regular operations and maintenance log or schedule this is the first option and we can choose another option along with the first one or we can select the other two options option number two is additional enhanced iaq comply with the requirements for one of the following uh, the first one is for mechanically ventilated spaces which we know that it involves the heat ventilation air conditioning systems to bring outdoor air and it has to be filtered so we will be using MERV 13 or minimum efficiency reporting value of 13 for the filters. Uh, this is the baseline or benchmark 13 or higher for each ventilating uh, systems that are installed in your building. Or there is another standard of having a class F7 or as a benchmark or higher as defined by CEN standard 779. Uh, the second one which we can follow and gain one point for option number two is putting CO2 or carbon dioxide monitors in all densely occupied spaces. The common example of densely occupied spaces would be would be any auditorium or a meeting room and it has to be places, uh, placed three to six feet above the floor and uh, you can see the how it looks like the CO2 detector and sensor. Uh, it should also provide a visual alarm if carbon dioxide concentration goes 15% more than whatever you have put it as a set point. And uh, the multi-occupied or densely occupied spaces uh, should be more than 14 square meter in order to qualify for uh, this uh, strategy in which you have to put CO2 monitors. Less than 14 square meters are exempted from the co2 monitoring uh, if you have mixed mode ventilation systems which mean natural plus mechanical or only mechanical ventilation system installed you should provide direct outdoor airflow measuring device capable to uh, measure 80 percent of the airflow and also able to compare it to the set point and generate an alarm if it uh, varies or deviate more than 15 percent from that set point the, the first one on this slide is about mixed mode or uh, the mechanical ventilation system. But the second and third one is when you have only naturally ventilated system. In that case, direct exhaust measuring device to measure the flow with plus minus 10%. Basically why we are all going through this because the ventilation systems are the key uh, to provide you with better indoor air quality. The air has to be changed so that fresh air comes in and the contaminated air gets out with all that co2 concentrations and if there is any odor or other stuff uh, an alarm in case of exhaust measuring device if uh, it varies more than 15 percent from the set point and the third one is also for the ventilation which says auto indication devices and all naturally ventilated openings which might be in this case the operable windows if they are closed during occupied hours it means that the natural ventilation is uh, being blocked and in that case it has to auto indicate um, by some alarm these are some of the airflow measuring devices uh, that uh, can be used for to fulfill the requirements of uh, this credit or this option for dc or data centers filtration media is required only for regularly occupied spaces uh, makes sense because in data centers uh, most of the grass floor area is for server rooms or other equipment and whatever we are applying as strategies is based on ventilation and uh, air quality uh, enhanced indoor air quality which is targeted towards humans filtration media is to follow a schedule for maintenance and uh, replacement the better you maintain the equipment the Li the life of the equipment will be longer and it will serve you better sensor calibrations uh, once every five years which also uh, serves the same purpose uh, that it will serve more and uh, accurate and maximum reading interval of 30 minutes 
like the sensor CO2 sensors that, uh, that we have seen in the previous slide. Calibrate all direct outdoor airflow and exhaust flow measuring devices as per manufacturer's recommended intervals to uh, give you the accurate results and serve you longer. The documentation is filtration media, MERV rating 13 or higher, as we saw in uh, the first option. In documentation showing that the filters are maintained to make sure that they are serving their purpose. What is uh, the location of your CO2 monitors? Either uh, it is in the space uh, area that is required less than 14 square meter will be exempted. So uh, their location is to be shown. Uh, the logs showing uh, their maintenance and trending data for 24 hours period uh, by taking uh, the readings from the maximum interval of 30 minutes and for all outdoor air monitoring or for mechanical or naturally ventilated sp uh, spaces are to be provided with all the control drawings and uh, the devices that are installed along with their maintenance plan and activity logs in case you have uh, found an issue and take any corrective action in case of naturally ventilated spaces where you have uh, put uh, the alarm for operable windows or if there was any other opening so alarmed openings are to be shown and submitted maintenance plan control drawings or list of installed devices so this is uh, documentation is for all the options but whatever you have uh, opted for your project you have to submit only that uh, part of the documentation an exemplary performance of one point can be earned if you achieve both option number one and two and more than one strategy in option number two. We had multiple strategies. First was outdoor and uh, outdoor airflow measurement, then exhaust flow measurement. Then we had carbon dioxide sensors. So if you achieve uh, more than one strategy, uh, then you can end option number one and two. Uh, a bonus point can be claimed for an exemplary performance. Prerequisite number three is green cleaning policy. Another policy that is dealing with uh, the cleaning. The purpose is to reduce the level of biological and con other contaminants that can compromise the health of the occupants and the general environment. It applies to uh, general cleaning and uh, under the, uh, the areas or the cleaning and the procedures and materials under management control. We remember that the general uh, criteria for LEED is that when it comes to the prerequisite, they are talking only about uh, the areas or services under management control. So uh, the standard operating procedures for the cleaning maintenance for anything like uh, carpet, hard floors, uh, using of disinfectants, sanitizers, uh, how they, what kind of products will you be purchasing uh, based on uh, the health and environmental hazards and uh, how they will be stored, how they will be used. And if uh, you will purchase certain uh, equipment, cleaning equipment that is uh, conserving energy and using less water, using less chemicals. So this will all be discussed in the option number one of GCP or green, uh, green cleaning policy. So the documentation is addressing the materials and services that are uh, uh, being purchased or used under green cleaning policy and description of your goals and strategies that how you will be conserving more energy and using less water during the cleaning so this is first option you can either go for this one or we've got the second option the option number two is that you have subcontracted or you have certified cleaning service uh, in that case the building is cleaned with uh, a service provider but the service provider should have certain qualifications like it is to be certified under green seals environmental standard for commercial cleaning services gs42 just like we have different certification bodies for uh, other purposes like carbon offsets should be green e climate certified or uh, we've got uh, some materials like uh, c2c certified similarly the cleaning services provided by any uh, a service provider should also be certified by green seals environmental standard or international sanitary supply association cleaning industry management standard for green buildings or if you have any local equivalent if uh, if you are outside us uh, they will also serve the same purpose and uh, the cleaning contractor it has to be audited within 12 months of 
performance period. Uh, strategies to conserve energy and water in cleaning are standard. Uh, whatever option you're going through, this is the key to have a policy in place to that is conserving energy and water. Uh, the documentation is uh, contract with uh, the certified vendor. The first your contract with the vendor and the vendor's contract with the, any certifying body, either it is GS42 or CIMS, GB, and date of certification, which should be within 12 months of performance period, and the strategies that you are implementing for conserving energy and water in your green cleaning policy. Credit number three, green cleaning custodial effectiveness assessment of one point for all adaptations, a continuation to green cleaning policy prerequisite to more credits to come. And the intent of this one is to reduce any contaminants by implementing useful procedures for cleaning. Now the requirement is to perform routine monitoring and inspection based on the guidelines provided by Association of Physical Plant Administrators. APPA, I would highly recommend that you go online and check what is APPA. They have changed their uh, name multiple times over the course of the history, and they issue guidelines to determine the appearance, the cleaning appearance level of any facility, uh, of any room, any office, any kitchen. So you've got a category of the room or type of uh, uh, the room, and uh, you have the cleanliness level, and it should score 2.5 or better in general. Uh, there, the scoring pattern and criteria, we will see it in the next slide. I have a sample table from uh, this APPA, and it will show what are the category of the rooms and how they are weighted. However, you have to audit five rooms minimum or 10% in each category, which means that more than 50, uh, if you've got 60 rooms, then you have to audit minimum six rooms. But in case of 30, 40 rooms, you have to audit minimum five rooms in each category. Uh, the documentation requires the green cleaning policy, which is uh, covered in our prerequisite, uh, addressing materials and services, description of your goals and strategies of the cleanliness, the, the level you want to achieve, and uh, also how you would be conserving water and energy during cleaning. As we saw it, it is continuous in green cleaning policy and also in the subsequent categories. These are the sample tables. First, look at the, the one on the right the smaller table which is basically for one room it could be a kitchen it could be a hallway uh, a classroom or an office we've got appearance level appearance item weighing factor perhaps the most important thing to understand and we've got a raw score now the weighing factor is given to any appearance item which which are floors horizontal surfaces lighting the more the weighing factor the more it is prone to get dirty like floors it is most prone to get dirty by shoes by dust would be uh, accommodating on the floors the first thing and then we've got appearance level five levels from uh, the number one best to worst five and then the raw score is calculated based on the factor the weighing factor times the level the weighing factor all of the weighing factors should be equal to 100 like floors 55 12 3 23 and 7 should be 100 and the raw score is calculated by multiplying the weighing factor into the appearance level, uh, which is just the visual inspection, whatever you think about uh, the cleanliness of floors. It's best, no, it's a little bit dusty. If it is uh, worst or there is too much dust and you have stains, then you would be rating it worst. So based on the visual inspection, you rate all of them and then you add up all the raw score. It comes out to be 241 in this example. Then you've got to divide it by 100 and it comes out to be 2.41. Now we saw in the previous slide that a score of 2.5 is uh, or better is there to qualify for the credit. Now this is for one room, then come now come to the uh, table on the left. We have the category of the space as defined by APPA and the space used in our facility or in our project or our building. So we have got uh, an office, and APA category is office. There is hallway in your uh, project, which in APPA category is circulation. And then you add all of the uh, offices in your project. We have rooms by type is 71. In our project, 71 rooms uh, categorized as an office. And uh, the cl by classification, it is 73. 
uh, which might be a little change because uh, some rooms you have classified as uh, not office, but it falls office as APPA category. Now 10% has to be taken uh, as per the slide, minimum 10% or five rooms. So in this case, eight rooms, then you have uh, the total square feet and the audited square feet, which is 10% of the category. Average score for space type is 2.41, which is uh, taken from the example here. Uh, on the right, similarly, you will calculate the average score for all the space types and then add all of them up to have an overall appearance of uh, overall appearance level. So this is how you calculate uh, room by room and then category by category, adding them, or them all up as per this sample. And if you are able to score more than 2.5, you will be able to earn this green cleaning custodial effectiveness assessment, which is based on visual cleaning inspection. Credit number four, green cleaning products and materials, one point. The purpose is to reduce any environmental harms uh, associated by any cleaning products that are used on your project. Now it is very similar to ongoing purchases where we were trying to purchase the materials that are used uh, inside the project and they are categorized as environmentally friendly. But the difference here is in ongoing purchases, we were purchasing the desktop accessories, batteries or computers, etc. But here in this uh, credit, it is uh, specific to cleaning materials. So any cleaning materials that we are buying for our project, uh, it is to be by cost 75%. Uh, it should meet one of the following standards. Similarly, we had their energy star rating, we had EPAT rating for uh, different uh, per, uh, products and per, uh, materials. Here we have different entities or different organizations that certify cleaning products. So we have Green Seal, uh, GS37 and GS40 for general purpose, uh, industrial and institution, uh, institutional floor care products respectively. We've got UL Eco logo. We have different numbers that certify for different products, disinfectants, metal polish, etc. So these are all the uh, purchases or materials or products that we need for cleaning inside our facility. It gets boring because I cannot dive into all uh, these standards or these uh, uh, you know, certifying bodies, but we know that there is a certifying body certifying the products or materials to be environmentally friendly. So we have drain or grease trap additives, auto control uh, for UL Eco Logo certified, certified GS5253 for speciality cleaning products. We have more to come. So for general cleaning, we know disposable janitorial products. They should meet UL Eco Logo for towel and toilet tissue, GS1 for tissue paper and napkins, and so on and so forth. We have hand soaps and sanitizers. They should meet these standards, GS41 UL Eco Logo. Basically, uh, we have to follow this 75% by cost and they should meet any one of these criteria. Project outside US, maybe they don't have all these certifying bodies uh, to certify these products. So they may find any equivalent, but it should uh, be under type one eco labeling program as defined by ISO standard. Uh, for the prerequisite, the purchases are only uh, confined to the site, to the areas or to the places where uh, it is managed by uh, the building owners, but in case of credit, it requires purchases by tenants to be included or else we will not be able to earn the credit. And this is how we can calculate the purchases by tenants. Uh, in the first table, you can see that we've got two tenants that are reporting what they are purchasing, what is compliant and what is not. So they have a certain floor area for uh, two of the tenants and they have total purchases out of this. Some purchases are compliant to these uh, eco logo and green seal, what we have seen. So uh, what they did was they tried to find out how much was the total floor area and how much were the total compliant purchases. Based on what we found out that there are total purchases per fee square of participating tenants. Now there are certain tenants that are not participating. They are not reporting. And one of the tenant is having a certain floor area, which is 15,000 in that case. And we have estimated that how much are the compliant purchases. So we, based on this estimate, 0 0.022, we'll multiply it by floor area of uh, the non-complying tenant, which we know that he's non-compliant and this is the floor area. And 
it comes out to be 330. And uh, compliant purchase zero because he did not report it. So once we make the whole building results, we will add all three of them. And the total purchases made by uh, the compliant and non-compliant will be added. And then we will take the ratio uh, for the percentage compliant purchases. First, we saw that how they are taking the compliant purchases. Then, then in the second table, they are estimating the non-compliant purchases and then adding them all up to find the percentage of the whole building. In this case, it will be non-compliant because we had to purchase 75% in order to earn this credit. The documentation, material safety data sheets of all purchased product because it would have the logo of Green Seal, Eco Logo, or whatever certifying body. Purchasing spreadsheet. Uh, in this uh, example, it's the total purchases, but it has to be broken down that you purchase napkin, towel, carpet care products, or whatever, and their uh, total uh, amount or value, and calculation showing compliance. In, in the particular example we saw above, this is non compliant, but this is is the way you will compile your calculation in order to submit. Credit number five is green cleaning for equipment. Means now uh, we have to reduce any uh, biological chemical and contaminants that can be produced by powered cleaning equipment. What it could be is like vacuums, any janitorial equipment, uh, any tile cleaning, uh, scrubbers, all these powered ones. Uh, are included in this equipment. Now, at least 40% of all power janitorial equipment must meet one of the following criteria. Must have safeguards, rollers or bumpers, just for the regular safety, and also not even safety for people, but also safety for tiles, for example. And ergonomic design to reduce noise, vibration, and fatigue. Ergonomic design is something that is designed based on uh, human ease easy to use and uh, less harmful. Uh, environmentally preferable batteries, if applicable to the product, if it works on batteries. And for vacuum cleaners and carpet extraction, there is a certain uh, requirement that they are to be certified by uh, CRI or Carpet and Rug Institute seal of approval. Uh, for this credit also, it also uh, requires equipment by tenants to be included or else we have uh, understood how we can find out uh, the non-compliant to purchases or in this case non-compliant equipment purchased by the tenants. One thing different from other credits that this green cleaning equipment uh, percentage compliance can be based on cost and number of products. So cost or number of products by total cost or number of products purchased. Uh, powered floor maintenance equipment must have uh, criteria. Noise level should be maximum 70 decibels. Propane powered should uh, be having mufflers to operate at 90 decibels. Automated scrubbing machines should use only tap water and must have variable speed drive. Phase out plan should be there just like we had a phase out plan for HVAC machines 10 years in case they are using uh, the CFC 11. So similarly, we have phase out plan for non-compliant products by the end of their useful life. Uh, the documentation is list of equipment and material safety data sheets showing sustainability criteria. One of the criteria that we have seen and contributing equipment calculation. We know now how to make that table for compliant and non-compliant tenants. Phase out plan, if there is, it should be submitted. Exemplary performance of one point if we meet the requirements for 100% of the equipment. The uh, essential requirement is only 40%. Credit number six is thermal comfort for one point in all adaptations. Might be a little subjective when it comes to different people, but we have to take care in order to promote their productivity and well-being. Uh, the requirement is to have a system in place to track and optimize these thermal comfort, which is based on four things or four factors. The first is air temperature. Makes sense. Uh, it's the feel inside any occupied space. Humidity, the more it goes, the uncomfortable it gets. Air speed is important because uh, I'm sure many of you has, uh, have uh, noticed that if air is blowing cold or hot right onto, their, uh, onto your face, it might feel uncomfortable. So uh, this is also a factor that uh, is involved in thermal comfort. And mean radiant temperature, which is the measure of average temperature of the surfaces that surround a particular point as shown in figure and with which it is going to exchange the thermal radiation. So if you are standing 
in front of a cold window in case of uh, winters or if uh, in you are standing in front of a campfire the means uh, the mean uh, radiant temperature uh, around you is going to be asymmetric because uh, not all the surface around you is having uh, same temperature so the average of all the temperatures around uh, one point is mean radiant temperature uh, the hospitality project and guest rooms are exempt from this credit requirement uh, because sometimes it depends on uh, the hotel guests and, uh, and so it's also might be uh, not required or uh, exempted in case of any hospital rooms there might be certain requirements uh, for the patient uh, data center projects need to fulfill requirements for only the spaces that are regularly occupied and in order to fulfill these uh, four factors we've got two options both the options we have here follow certain standard we have uh, known from uh, previous uh, credit categories that there is uh, ASHRAE 90.1, which was important for energy. We had one standard called ASHRAE 62.1, which was for ventilation. And now we have ASHRAE 55, that is for permanent monitoring system thermal comfort. And similarly, another standard, ISO 7730 or CEN 15251, uh, they also emphasize on permanent monitoring system. but uh, either you use ASHRAE or the other for option number two, the monitoring system must meet the following. The first thing is that it, any monitoring system should be able to monitor the temperature and humidity at minimum 15 minutes uh, intervals or even less than that. Uh, the monitoring of airspeed and radiant temperature can be done by handheld devices. And uh, if there is any deviation from the standard or set point, and if there is any repair or fault, that is to be done an alarm should be generated and there must be standard operating procedures to address the alarm and all monitoring devices just like we saw in in this carbon dioxide sensor that they are to be calibrated here also these uh, devices should also be calibrated as per the recommendation of the manufacturer for the documentation the proof of what we have seen in the previous slide these are some of the hand, handheld devices the right and left the right one is for mean radiant temperature the left one is for air speed and the center one is uh, a digital sensor for temperature and humidity uh, we have to submit the criteria based on which we have uh, established our thermal comfort and uh, the continuous temperature and uh, humidity monitoring including where you have put your sensors uh, there might be a drawing that is showing the sensor locations the frequency of uh, uh, data collection and how they are being logged and periodic monitoring of the temperature and airspeed description uh, we know that we need to put an alarm in case of any deviation or uh, repair required and the SOPs uh, in case the alarm is uh, is wrong and the calibration and maintenance log as per the manufacturing uh, manufacturer recommendation Credit number six is interior lighting for one to two points. It plays an important role when it comes to the environmental quality indoors. Two options to comply. The first one is to provide the lighting control for 90% of individual occupant spaces. Uh, individual occupant spaces would be uh, like a single, or single person office and 100% for combined occupant spaces like uh, a common work floor or uh, a a space in which more than one people are sitting and we have to provide three levels of control the regular one we use is on and off so it's two level we have to provide three level in order to earn this credit uh, the lighting for presentations or projection rooms might be separately controlled or it could be exempted uh, the documentation is the table of individual and multi-occupant spaces and also what kind of controls are provided in each space the second option can go with with this with the first one so you can opt uh, for both and earn both the points the second one is lighting quality uh, the interior lighting must meet four out of eight offered strategies now let's see what are these strategies the first one is light fixture luminance the, it is to use fixtures less than 2500 candelas per meter square now if you see the figure on the left below all these terminologies are, are a bit confusing. Luminance, luminous intensity, luminous flux, illuminance. I'll try to explain. 
the amount of light that is emitted from the source is called luminous flux and it's measured in lumens but light moves in almost all directions so any light rays moving in certain direction would be measured in candelas and it would call it would be called luminous intensity then amount of light that is falling on an object is called a luminance and it is measured in lumens per square meter which is usually known as lux and cameramen are more uh, interested in lux because they want to know that how much light is falling on an object and the light we see is the reflected version or the rays that are reflected from the object and which is called luminance and it is measured in candelas per square meter I think the best analogy would be if you have a water source it would be called luminous flux measured in lumens and if you are pointing water in certain direction it would be luminous intensity and the water that is falling on a floor it would be a luminance and the water that is splashed out from the surface of the floor would be luminance I hope it made some sense the second is color rendering index to use light sources with CRI 80 or higher. Now, what is color rendering index? It's a comparison of uh, how the colors are perceived or how good the colors appear in that light as compared to sunlight. The more, the better. The maximum is 100. So CRI 70 is poor colors, 80 is better, and 90 is more closer as they would have appeared in sunlight. The lamp life, at least uh, 24,000 hours for 75% of connected light. Then we've got the four strategy, direct only overhead lighting, less than 25% should be uh, following this one. Surface reflectance as per the given values and surface reflectance from furnishings, average reflectance should be 45% of work surfaces. Remember, we've got to select four. We've got total eight surface illuminance ratio wall to wall you know now what is illuminance need average surface reflectance of less than 1 by 10 for 75 percent of regularly occupied area and surface illum uh, illuminance ratio from ceiling to work surface would also require the same amount like 1 by 10 for 75 percent it's a bit tricky uh, documentation is table of regularly occupied space and lighting controls for one and four we, we have different strategies uh, numbered one to eight and different documentation for them the first four are basically the easiest one to uh, comply with so lighting details results of estimations because the first four strategies are usually given by the manufacturer like the lamp life what is the uh, luminance and everything so a uh, list of ceiling wall and floor reflectance surfaces for the fifth strategy and so on and so for just whatever strategy you follow you have to submit the proof in the documentation credit number eight is daylight and quality views for two to four points in all adaptations uh, we all agree that having daylight in our space looks nice so connect the building occupants with outdoors by introducing daylight and views to this space it will also help reducing in electrical lighting because if you have daylight first of all it looks nice secondly if you are not using the electrical lighting it would help you in energy efficiency but multiple options the first option is for two points which is uh, for daylight measurements we have to measure the illuminance levels which is lux it is measured by lux meters and uh, it should be between 300 and 3000 lux from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in 50 percent of regularly occupied areas we know what is regularly occupied areas the work floor or the offices that are occupied on regular basis daylight illuminance measurements to be taken by light meter which is the lux meter and the measurements should be five to nine months apart why because we know that the sun path is not the same throughout the year so we will find out after five to nine months if we are still in the range of 300 and 3000 lux based on this if we made our first calculation or measurement in january then the second measurement should be in between may and september february uh, first measurement then between june to october and so on and so forth based on this table one more requirement saying that if you have a space that is 
more than 150 square feet, then you have to take the measurements on 10 feet square uh, grid. However, if the space is less than 150, then the measurement should be taken on three square feet grid. Based on the example below, the first measurement is taken in June and the second in between five to nine months apart and measurement is done in October. 12 times eight, uh, the width of the rooms times the length of the room is 96 and it falls under the category of less than 150 square feet. So the measurements are taken on three feet square grid. And we saw that the first one is 280 lux, 630, 1200, and so on. And with the next one, 150. Uh, but what was our baseline? Our baseline or benchmark was 300 to 3000 lux. So if it does not meet the requirement, it will not qualify. The documentation is to have the list of all the occupied spaces in your project what grid size they fall in if they are less than 150 square feet or more than 150 square feet the grid size would change and uh, the first and second measurements the first one taken in any month and that second one in between five to nine months from the first and the calculations that they are compliant which is within the range of 300 and 3000 lux the second option you can pursue with the first one or without the first one and it's based on the quality views you have from inside of your uh, area to the outside. Uh, we should have two out of four types of views. The first one is you can have two out of these four. The first one is multiple lines of sight, at least 90 degrees apart. The second is unobstructed views within three times head height. I have uh, the visual explanation coming in the next slide. Uh, the view factor, what is view factor, it will be shown. And view that includes two from flora, fauna, sky. Flora, fauna is basically animals and plants. Sky, movement, and objects at 25 meter distance. The main idea is that you're able to see outside and feel good. Uh, the picture that is attached here, it's really good to see outside when you have uh, this scenery. A little explanation on the types of views. Let's look at the fourth one first view that includes uh, two from flora, fauna, sky, movement. I think that is easier. Uh, any plants and uh, animals movement or sky that can be seen out of the window. Uh, the third one is view with view factor of three or more. So these are the view factors. Uh, the higher the number, the better is the view. So view factor of five, if you see the figure on top, uh, with the chairs this is a view factor of five and we've got two more multiple lines of sight at least 90 per, 90 degrees apart and um, unobstructed views within three times the head, head height when it comes to multiple lines of sight at least 90 degrees apart the figure on the right explains what does it mean you can see uh, 90 degrees apart and it's un unobstructed and the view that we saw in the previous figure where we had the chairs it also complies with multiple lines of sight at least 90 degrees apart uh, the second uh, unobstructed views within three times the head height what is the head height uh, the f uh, height of the window opening from the floor is called the head height so let's have a look at this figure on the left we've got two offices and almost three meters is the head height uh, the window uh, top from uh, the floor and the three times is almost nine meters now in case of office number one we have unobstructed views uh, for all the occupants whereas in office number two we have a fixed partition that is blocking the view from three times the head height so office number one is compliant whereas office number two is not compliant with unobstructed views within three times the head height so we had uh, in option number two, vision glazing or sight of outdoors 50 per, for 50% of all regularly occupied floor area having two out of these four types of view, which we have discussed with examples in detail. Some conference rooms, auditoriums and gym may be excluded from the view requirements. And it makes sense because sometimes it may be due to the privacy or you do not want that light to be in. It's a kind of a uh, you have projector. So there could be multiple reasons and they can be excluded. 
Views into interior atria, the two beautiful images below, may meet 30%. Remember, we need to meet 50%, but atria may meet 30% of the required area. When it comes to warehouses and storages, of course, the requirements are not the same because not all areas are occupied by people. So warehouse required is applicable, uh, requirements are applicable to only office area and for bulk storage meeting requirements for 25% of regularly occupied area will earn the credit. Documentation is list and floor plans of all regularly occupied spaces and it has to be consistent uh, for all the credit requirements or all the credits where we need the regularly occupied spaces requirement, qualifying floor area and view type out of two out of four in each space exemplary performance can be earned if you achieve 75 percent of occupied area for both option number one and option number two credit number nine is integrated pest management for two points uh, the intent is to minimize both the pest problems and after applying the pesticides uh, the purpose is to minimize the exposure of it to the building occupants to fulfill this intent we should have an integrated pest management plan that is an ipm not only for the buildings but also for the grounds that are within the project boundary because from the grounds they are able to slip in and uh, the ipm should include the following elements identification of ipm team and their roles really important uh, we have to uh, have a team and their roles should be defined so that we know that who has to do what when and how so there should be a provision how to identify and how they will be monitoring the pests how often they will uh, can conduct any inspections and in case any pesticide issue is uh, noted by any occupant what would be the reporting system for them to report it to the ipm team action threshold what uh, they are going to do when they will encounter uh, any pest issue uh, the first priority should be that non-chemical pest uh, preventive measures are to be taken and uh, potential control methods with least risk risks to the occupant based on inherent toxicity what does it mean it means that you will try to minimize the use of any pesticides that are inherently toxic in nature and will go for more natural ones if this is not possible if least risk control is not applicable we have to list why maybe uh, to control a certain uh, pest issue it's uh, not possible or you're not able to find any product that is uh, least risk uh, in that case you have to submit a reason that why we are not using any least risk control continuation of these uh, elements me mechanism of inspection control monitor prevent and evaluation of that plan very important because uh, you devise a plan and you found an issue it was reported then you try to encounter it did it work or not so effectiveness of ipm plan is really important you have to note note down that how effective any measure taken was a uh, strategy of communication between ipm team and the occupants that how well it was uh, integrated how well it was communicated if you have applied any pesticides you should have a plan whether it would be a memos or emails or uh, if there is any other way in uh, to tell the occupants that uh, the pests are applied or how the issue was reported and how it has been taken care of keep record of all pests applied under ipm plan i think this is this is uh, basics that you should know what you have done under your plan credit can be earned now this was all for in-house if you had uh, a maintenance team that is working in-house but uh, in case you have a subcontractor or vendor who is doing all this for you credit can be earned if pest control is done by vendor certified by a third party all the time when you are bringing any third party in it has to be certified by some other entity or some other organization that uh, basically certifies their qualification so if uh, the vendor is certified by green pro ecovisor green shield the credit can be earned for integrated pest management and two points the documentation is ipm plan and tracking tool that you have uh, developed for in-house and pesticide application list if any green pro and ecowise or green shield certificate 
if you are uh, if you are doing this pest management uh, by any external vendor credit number 10 is occupant comfort survey for one point kind of self-explanatory we've got to assess building occupants comfort by doing a survey and we have to record the responses as anonymous it should include five things the acoustics building cleanliness indoor air quality lighting and thermal comfort all of them are really subjective which means there is no definitive or one correct answer that's the reason we've got seven levels or seven possible answers either you are very satisfied uh, or mostly satisfied somewhat up to very dissatisfied anything on the left side of the neutral would be considered satisfied and any dissatisfied number of answers would be weighed or and there will be a percentage of dissatisfied occupants and the responses must come from 30 percent of the total building occupants in order for the survey to be valid and if we found out that out of uh, these five uh, comfort areas if 20 percent of occupants are found to be dissatisfied we have to have an action plan and it is to be uh, it is to be sorted out documentation is copy of survey addressing the five characteristics and summary of these results and corrective action in case 20 percent of occupants are dissatisfied in the table here we can see that building cleanliness 25 percent are dissatisfied and thermal comfort is uh, reported uh, dissatisfied mostly somewhat or very dissatisfied by 30 percent so there should be an action plan for these two characteristics or domains uh, this sums up uh, the chapter of indoor environmental quality thank you very much for your attention